Yeah. If you can't pay the bail, you sit in jail. If you can make the bail, you get out. That's not justice. That's two forms of justice, one for the rich and one for the poor. It's a reform that was touted by Governor Andrew Cuomo and signed into law, bail reform. Those two words mean come next month, New York judges will not issue cash bail for misdemeanor and nonviolent felony crimes. That means no bail in 90% of cases where people are charged with a crime but not convicted. Come January 1st, there's going to be a lot of people who are currently off our streets that are going to be right back on our streets. NYPD Chief of Department Terrence Monahan told PIX11's Corey Chambers he believes the streets of New York will be less safe with the new program. Someone burglarizes your apartment, he gets out with no bail. Someone robs you on the street, pushes you down, reaches into your pocket, takes your stuff, robbery third degree, no bail. You sell a kilo, a kilo of cocaine to an undercover police officer, no bail. That's way too far. Senator Kirsten Gillibrand on the issue. I want to say this very clearly. We should not be locking people up in jail because they cannot afford their bail, period. It's really that simple. I believe our country is much better than that. And I believe that we need to give people the opportunity to thrive. The reform law also gives defense lawyers the right to see prosecution evidence, including witness names and visit crime scenes, which prosecutors say can hurt a case moving forward. Commissioner James O'Neill, who just left his post, said lawmakers didn't do their homework on this during his last visit to the Pigs Live Morning News as commissioner. Law enforcement across New York State had no input into that. That was done by legislators and, and, and other people, but not by us. There are people like a Khalif Browder who couldn't make a small bail and then was in jail for yeah. quite some time. Yeah, and I, I listen, I'm a, I'm a proponent of bail reform. So no one should really be in on a hundred to five hundred thousand dollars bail. I understand that. Uh, if there's a significant criminal history there, though, there, there, ha there has to be consequences. Right. And we, we know who's committing the crime. And it, 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 some people have to stay in. And again, not a lot of people, but uh, I'm concerned. And I, I'm, I'm an optimist. I am. But uh, I'm really concerned about this. So obviously there are concerns on both sides of the aisle here. So let's bring back our panel right here and Marie and Darren and get your positions on both of this. So Darren, you are a former NYPD lieutenant yourself. What are your thoughts about the possibility of, or what's actually going to take place in January of 2020? Well, I think that this is a, a failure of our government. So when we look at the bureaucratic system that we have in play, this is clearly uh, an inability to introduce justice to civilians. Um, I've worked in the communities of color and the communities of color are under siege. And these are many cases the people that are the recipients of uh, not just the miscarriage of um, justice, but violence. When I say violence, meaning a lot of these, uh, a lot of the violent crime occurs in these communities of color. And I just think that there's a, a victimization times two that happens when someone is the victim of a crime and then that same perpetrator comes out without receiving a bail and they see that same individual four hours later. So as a result of this, I think that this needs to be revisited. I'm okay with a pilot project uh, a pilot project to see if this is effective but we need to have a reassessment phase in here so I want to say it was a six months to possibly a year we want to see how effective this is and then we can revisit it the Khalif Browder situation has been something that's amplified through the walls of justice mm -hmm. and when we look at what happened with the Khalif Browder case there was a systematic failure in the criminal justice system when we look at what happened from the Bronx District Attorney's perspective that was really the linchpin in what happened. The police department merely made the arrest and I, I, I question the arrest that was made based on the evidence that they had. Right. But did I feel that they had probable cause to make the arrest? I believe that was in play. But when we take in consideration the victim's inability to show up to court, I think it reached a certain point whereas the district attorney should have released Khalif Browder and this seems to be the harbinger for this bail reform. But do you think that this will make New York City safe or unsafe? I think that we're going to see uh, some changes, and it's, re it's very difficult. I want to say that we, as time is progressing, we're going to see the crime rates increase. And I don't think it's so much of just the bail reform. I think there's an amalgamation of other instances that come into play, pri primarily the socioeconomics. I think the communities of color in particular are the recipients of misfortunes of the way the government is moving. And I think as a result, the byproduct is going to be an increase in crime. But I don't believe that it's just this bail reform as a total isolation. Right. Well, I agree with that last part. Um, I actually don't think bail reform is going to lead to any increase in crime in the city. Um, bail is, um, I mean, traditionally, it's a mechanism 
of release, right? Uh, the court sets a s amount of money on your case. It's supposed to be amount of money that you can pay, but that will entice you to return to court mm -hmm. so that you can face the charges against you. Um, over the decades, it's turned into basically a mechanism for detention. Um, judges have been setting bail that's out of the grasp of people. Um, and we're talking about poor people, right? There's no rich person is sitting on Rikers Island right now, right? We are talking about people where the one thing they all have in common is that they are poor and they cannot afford the amount of money that was set on them. Or they're, or they're, or they're violent. Fit. A, crim a violent offense that did not get a bail. Oh, yes. Or they were remanded for, you know, a more violent offense, mm -hmm. um, you know, something like a homicide. But right. the majority of people who are held in pretrial are held in on a, a money amount of bail um, and are not remanded. So, what, so for, the, for those who are opposed to it, what is the benefit of releasing somebody who, say, robbed your house, right, and putting them back on the streets while they're, before their trial takes place? Well, it's this is all pretrial. So that person who you're saying Roger House is innocent until proven, is guilty. Innocent until proven guilty, right? Um, and there is no uh, benefit, like pretrial detention does not keep people safe. All it does is actually disrupt and harms those people and their communities and their families, right? That person you're holding pretrial is not gonna be able to go to school if they're young, they're not gonna be able to go to work if they're employed, if they are a caregiver for a child, they're not gonna be able to care for that child or an elderly person, they're not going to be able to care for that person, right? So it's very disruptive to take someone who is a, accused of a crime, you know, it's an allegation, and disrupt their life in that manner, and then at the end of the day, they might be found not guilty, um, the case may not proceed to trial, they may be offered a lesser charge, but the damage has already been done. So why are we doing that in the first place when we can just have non-monetary conditions or release people on their own recognizance? And the evidence shows that people overwhelmingly come back to court, no matter what their condition of release is. So uh, we're getting comments right now. Cynthia saying because bail for blacks is so high and they know some can't get the money so they'll have to do the jail time. Um, someone saying this is ridiculous and that bail is just too high all the time. So Darren, my question is, if somebody were to allegedly rob somebody's house, right? What the, it seemed like what Chief Monahan from the NYPD was saying was they get put back on the street. What's to say they won't commit another crime during that time period while they're already awaiting trial for another crime? The recidivism is something that does come into place when you speak to someone that's home was robbed or burglarized, so to speak. If someone is the victim of a crime, it's just a slap in the face. And it's very difficult for us to make the assessment as to if there's going to be a recidivist um, in connection with this. But the truth of the matter is we need to have a level of accountability. I just think that this evolution of a progressive nature of New York is really t t taking us to places like Los Angeles and San Francisco. It seems like we're going to hell in a handbasket mm -hmm. at a record rate. Um, I can tell you personally, I've worked in these communities of color as a police officer, and, they, and people that are victims of crimes, they want to see results. They don't want to see the person that just punched them in the face to be back on the street all over again. There's a very small component of this population that's actually for this. But when you look at the overwhelming majority, these communities of color are under siege, yeah. and they have an expectation of an assistance from the criminal justice system, and we're merely not going to afford them that as a result. And when it goes back to the uh, people not showing up for courts, we have hundreds of people on a day-to-day -day basis that just don't show up for court. Mm -hmm. And as a result of them not showing up for court, a warrant is issued. We need to have something that can hold people to, to showing back up to court because if there's no cash bail, then what is the, what is the plausible alternative to ensure that this person comes I have to a court? response to two things. I think, one, I want to push back on this notion that victims of crime um, in the pretrial context are owed punishment at that point. Pre-trial, bail is not meant to be punishment. It is meant to ensure that this person returns to court. Mm -hmm. You are not punished for a crime until after you are either convicted or you plead guilty. So we do not owe people punishment for an alleged action prior to this person being adjudicated. The second thing is that the evidence and our practice shows that the overwhelming majority of people return to court. If they're released on their own recognizance, they return to court 88% of the time. If they're released for supervised release, those people return to court about 90% of the time. The bail funds, the charitable bail funds in this city that bail people out, without any of those people putting down their money, it's somebody else's money, those people have been returning to court at 95% of the time, 
right? We have an overwhelming majority of people who comply with their conditions of release, and we cannot be legislating around this minority because we want to make sure that, you know, those hundreds of people also come back to court. There's There are many reasons why people miss court, and the way to address that mm -hmm. is with services, um, support, um, giving people, you know, transportation, yeah. child care, education. And those people, I'm sure, will then add to those numbers. Do you have a response? Of res yes, I, I never advocated for punishment. I think that it's necessary to have a separation after someone commits to a crime against another individual. I don't think it's right for the victim to see that person four hours later. I think that this should be a time that should elapse. Now, if a person makes bail, that's fine. But I never adjudicated this as a punishment. And the second component of that is... Uh, people not showing up. If you look at the statistics for the NYPD's warrant division, we have astronomical numbers of people that have warrants just because the defendants are not showing up to court. So do you know how this number is going to increase when we don't have a cash bail? I'm saying this as a practitioner with boots on the ground in this particular area. Many times mm -hmm. I've gone and knocked on people's doors for summons as simple as hopping the turnstile. And so that's a situation where a lot of times these people didn't get a bail. So imagine when we have a situation where no one gets a bail, we're going to have numbers that go through the roof. And what it's going to take is going to take a lot of resources and man hours from the NYPD to go and look for these people that have not shown up to court as a result. I don't believe that that's going to be the case because the legislation does have in there built in that the court must provide pretrial services yeah. and um, also do court reminders and notifications. And if that is done effectively, um, I do not believe we are going to fall um, into this uh, so, despair that you are. So we do have a new describing. police commissioner. Obviously, Dermot Shea just came, took over the helm this weekend. About an hour ago, he held a press conference addressing the topic of bail reform, almost walking back a little bit of what Chief Monahan talked about, how the city might be a more dangerous place because of this. Let's listen to what he had to say. What, what the law does is it doesn't change the penalty. The penalty is it's still an A misdemeanor, and the penalty is punishable by up to a year in jail. What it does do is change the process from time of arrest to time they eventually go before an arraignment and then have the case adjudicated. Um, and they're changing now with this and many other crimes. They're, they're legislatively putting into effect when the police must issue somebody a desk appearance ticket. So it won't change the penalty. It'll change from time of arrest, who's eligible to be remanded, kept in jail, when they must go to the judge. Do I have concerns about parts of it? Yes, I do. I do. So do you see this, guys, uh, final comments here, as a disruption of the process in a more positive way for both the city and the MIPD who have to handle these crimes and those who are affected by this, or is it a negative impact? What do you see as that? I mean, I think it's a, definitely a positive. Um, I think the reason why... Um, uh, Sorry, Commissioner O'Shea has to walk that a little bit back is because over the last couple of months, um, the prosecutors and police have been going on a fear-mongering campaign, and they're the ones scaring the public into believing that the sky is going to fall down and there's going to be blood in the streets. And I think that maybe they're starting to realize that that is very irresponsible of them to do that, and we should all be working together to make sure that these reforms actually work instead of scaring um, the public into believing that, you know, something horrible is going to happen. There. I'm a proponent of assessments. If this is what's rolling out is clear, the train is not going to stop. But let's take a look at it. Let's see how this works. We need to do a reassessment either six months or a year in, and then we'll figure out, we'll factor in if this has been successful or it's not been successful. It's not going to change. And I think that's going to be the telltale decision as to what's going to happen moving forward. I think uh, yep. just to respond to that last point, I wanted to do it before I apologize. A, we're not going to know completely whether or not bail reform or any of these reforms is a complete success within six months or one year. I think the reality is our current bill has been allowed to fail us for decades, right? And when that kept failing us, when Khalif Browder died, when, you know, all those people um, lost their lives in the Erie County Jail, the Broome County Jail, people in law enforcement don't get up and say, okay, we've assessed this and we found out that this doesn't work, so we want to change the system now. That system gets to perpetuate. So I think what we all should be doing is giving this time to work. And we can't undo decades of despair and devastation that has been caused by the laws that we have right now within a six-month or one-year period. And I don't think that's fair. 
final comment there. The quantitative assessment is going to determine if people are in fact showing up to court. Mm -hmm. And that I don't think is hard for you to figure out over a six month or one year time phase. That will happen. 